This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Thank you again for listening to Beyond the Big Screen Podcast. Of course, a big thanks goes out to our frequent guest, Josh Cohen, host of the Eyewitness History Podcast. Josh is also a member of, like I am, the Parthenon Podcast Network. More can be found about Josh's podcast at his website, eyewitnesshistory.com. A great way to support the show, there's actually two, is to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. That's always appreciated. And if you want to make that next step to support the podcast just a little bit more financially, go over to patreon.com forward slash beyond the big screen to learn more about the great benefits that come with supporting the show on Patreon. You can learn more about Beyond the Big Screen, how to support the show, and how to get in contact with me by going over to our website, beyondthebigscreen.com. Links to all of this and much, much more can be found in the show notes. I thank you again for joining me, Beyond the Big Screen. I'd like to welcome back host of the Eyewitness History Podcast, Josh Cohen. Josh has joined us to talk about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, The Hateful Eight, and Django Unchained. We continue our study of Quentin Tarantino and wrap up his historical drama phase with the 2009 film Inglorious Bastards. Bastards with an E, of course. This movie is set in a fictional alternative history of World War II. We see many of the aspects of this film we have come to know and love, maybe, from Quentin Tarantino. So, uh, Josh, how are you doing and what do you think about this movie, Inglorious Bastards? I'm doing very well, Steve. Thanks again for having me. Any, any day when you and I get to talk is a, a good day in my book. Um, Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I uh, probably won't be a surprise to you or any of our mutual listeners at this point that I, I love the movie. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a biased uh, Tarantino bootlicker. I'm the first to admit it. <laughs> um, uh, Inglorious Bastards was very interesting because this was his first movie that ventured into the historical fiction genre um, of which he's now produced, as you say, you know, um, Hey Filet and uh, uh, Django Unchained and, and the rest of it, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, it fo- The film follows two separate assassination plans uh, on Hitler and the, the Upper Third Reich ilk. Um, one is uh, led by uh, Brad Pitt as Lieutenant Aldo Rain and his uh, aforementioned and titular uh glor- inglorious bastards by the way the way the, the reason the word bastards is spelled with an e and not an a um is in order is in order to distinguish it from uh, a like name a like named film uh that was also called well uh is in order to distinguish it from a film in 1978 called in fact inglorious bastards spelled spelled the right way so for anyone listening that might be interested in that um so the the one uh assassination plan is by these inglorious bastards which are effectively a uh a ragtag branch of the American military. Um, I think they say it's OSS at the end. We'll, we'll get there. And then the second is led by uh, Melanie Lorenz character, Shoshana, otherwise known as Emmanuel Mimu, uh, who, w- which is her, uh, her alter. Um, and she is someone who escapes the, um, is someone who escapes, uh, let's say persecution under an assumed identity. Um, comes into possession of a movie theater, and she also has it out for for the Germans. So that's what this movie follows. I think it was um, they start off the movie right off the bat where uh, Brad Pitt as Aldo Reigns, he puts together almost what you might call a Jewish dirty dozen. I think they even referred to it at some point in other uh, websites as that was very dirty dozen esque the way he forms them together. Uh, maybe explain a little bit what was there. T- what was their job the inglorious bastards well uh that's might be the easiest question you'll ask me tonight uh steve because when brad pitt's addressing his uh his team the bastards before they're set off he says we'll be doing one thing and one thing only killing nazis (laughs) um as he says that the nazis are the foot soldiers of a jew hating mass murdering maniac and they need to be destroyed um so that's that's their plan uh they uh, or their goal, rather, 
Um, and what they want to do is they want to basically follow the uh, Apache game, uh, the Apache rules of engagement, because uh, Brett, because Lieutenant Alderain says that he's the direct, direct descendant of the mountain man, Jim Bridger. So uh, every every Jew, every German that they kill, they scalp. Maybe lay out, we'll lay out our, where we're coming from. You love the movie. I would say of the four hmm. that we've discussed of the Hateful Eight, Django Unchained, and once upon a time in Hollywood, it was my least favorite, hmm. but I came around to it that I, I really didn't like it initially. And after I thought about it some more, I, it started to grow on me. I guess maybe what are the things that really struck this one? And maybe if you could put it in to uh, how you feel it fit into how you liked these various four of the historical dramas of Tarantino. Well, first off, it's got to be remembered that Inglorious Bastards is the first historical fiction movie that Tarantino does. So, you know, uh, I understand that I was coming into this cold. I didn't really know what it was about. And when I realized it was a fictional retelling of of history, um, that, that was what sort of seized me. And look, any movie where Nazis are being killed is probably a decent enough movie <laughs> worth, worth the time. Another thing that drew me into the the movie, it's it's going to be a sort of a stereotypical answer because it's been said to death and you even alluded to it just a minute ago, but the a phenomenal performance by Christoph Waltz, who uh, was a, a big enough star in, in Germany and indeed Europe for, for years, uh, unknown to to me and I, I suspect you as well until Inglorious Bastards. Um, and uh, I, the whole time I, I, it was one of those performances that was just so good. It just stays with you as it's happening. Um, so uh, the great performance of him seized me. And then also Brad Pitt played such a, in uh, a character that seemed at the time, cause this is, this is now over 10 years old, 10, 10 years ago. Um, at the time seems somewhat antithetical to parts that he's played in the past. He usually plays a good, uh, a, a pretty boy or a tough guy, pretty boy. I'm, I'm thinking like Tyler Durden and fight club, but here he was just playing a straight up, you know, badass um, yeah, with the action hero. Yeah. Who talked, who talked kind of weird, whose face had a history, you know, uh, th there's a scar in his neck. That's never fully explained. He, um, delves a little bit into his background when he's talking with Christoph Waltz towards the end about, about being a, 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 a bootlegger from uh, Maynardville, Tennessee. Uh, and then also good old fashioned Tarantinian violence. Um, I knew right when uh, the bear Jew hit that Nazi with the baseball bat, exactly what kind of movie I was in for. And I was here for it. One of the things that really came across with me is I'm not, maybe moral ambiguity is not the right choice the right the word choice but i think that tarantino played with our emotions with it with so many that yeah these german soldiers they're nazis as a way but they're also they're regular people too like when they in the scene i will be skipping around in this episode just because <laughs> I, I think that i guess we'll get this out of the way i think we've seen this with the other tarantino movies that it's very difficult to just follow one thread because there's so many different threads coming together well, and there's multiple plots happening simultaneously yeah it's really hard but so i think maybe we'll carry this one through where it, the violence is even extra violent because he's humanizing these german soldiers but at the same time kind of d demonizing them too so Yes, I, I think I know what you mean, um, because in the indeed in the opening scene with Christoph Waltz as, as Hans Landa, um, we, we know right off the bat that we're supposed to hate him. We know yeah. that because he's wearing a Nazi uniform. That's what could be simpler than that. But in the course of the discussion, um, he comes off as charming, polite. Um, uh, you know, this being your house, I ask your permission to continue this conversation, have the rest of this conversation in English. Um could you please ask your lovely ladies to step outside? Uh, would it disturb you if I smoked my pipe? You know, um, yeah, very polite and and done very well. But there was, of course, there was this brooding, sadistic uh, 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 intention and attitude that was brewing beneath the surface. Um, it was such a masterful yeah. performance. I mean, well, we could do a whole other podcast just, just on how on great him, yeah. that performance <laughs> without quite, and I'd be here for it. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, um, and he was asked, he was on some talk show, Christoph Waltz was, and they asked him, so, uh, how, why would you play a, a Nazi this way? Someone who's likable. It, it's hinted in the movie that he, he's a womanizer. So charming. Um, 
And he goes, well, there's, there's no one way to play a Nazi. If I look at you and I say, uh, play a Nazi, how would one do that? You could go the route that you and I would expect, which is probably something like Ray, uh, Ray Fiennes and Schindler's List. Yeah. Right. Um, another phenomenal performance, by the way. Uh, but here, he, as you say, he humanizes them. Um, and I think we have Christoph Waltz to thank for that. There's also the, uh, again, I'll, I'll follow your lead and, and skip around, um, in that, in that bunker scene, which I hope we talk about, it might oh, be, yeah. it, it might be along with Leo's monologue in, in Django Unchained, it might be my favorite scene of all of Tarantino's anthology. The one who joins the table playing the game, um, and is perfectly polite and serviceable and someone that you could see indeed having a beer with, uh, it was the performances that sort of anchored the Nazis into a real, I don't want to say morality, but they, they did humanize them because it, it's, it has to be said that Nazis were just people that were following an evil ideology. Right. And some of that bleeds through, I think in the, in, in the movie. And then, but then just the, the very last thing is, um, is, uh, the officer in that same bunker scene who has a son that night. Mm -hmm. If you, if you recall Maximilian, yeah. uh, yep. And, uh, they're celebrating and you're seeing that, I mean, you don't get quite more humane than that. Someone having a son and, and celebrating. You get that through Londa and then the, the other officer, the Nazi officer in that bunker scene or the tavern scene in the basement where you get, you know that they're straight up evil they're ss they're wearing the ss uniforms and then you get those the so they're pretty much they're voluntarily evil i guess you might say or willfully evil but then you have the soldiers like the one who was um who had just had his baby or the one who the bear jew hits with the um the 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 bat and in a lot of ways that could be anybody, a draftee. And, you know, they're Nazis. They're not Nazis. I think he really, with a lot of those things, he took like the dark line you could draw between good and evil and he smudged it out just really in incredibly in a way. And right. And, and did it in a way that was that was fun and interesting and believable. Too. There was no part of it that seemed like it was a caricature or 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 a parody to me. I mean, even the, the name that I I uh, didn't mention, but was was thinking about it, Frederick Zoller, the 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 war hero. Well, as far as the Nazis are concerned, the war hero. Um, you know, throughout the movie, he he sort of comes off as this um uh not quite a Prince Charming because he doesn't charm <laughs> Melanie Lorenz character, but you know, as, as a sort of doting you know, aw shucks guy who's, who's just trying to get the girl. Um, so he, he, even there, we see the, the, the moral ambiguity there. It's fascinating stuff. His more, uh, Zoller's ambiguity is really interesting because they don't actually, I don't believe they actually say it, but I hmm. get the, I got the drift that he didn't actually do what they claim that he did oh. where he killed the, 300 soldiers like that was completely blown out of proportion and you could i i felt like it kind of weighed on him the way he acted it the role so that's actually very interesting i haven't i i hadn't heard that particular theory um but i tell you as you're saying it uh steve it makes sense because uh you will recall that when they show the the movie in the theater he doesn't want to watch the scene yeah now part of that uh, I sort of took that as an appeal to his, his, uh, again, that, that moral ambiguity. He didn't, you know, he did it, but he didn't like that. He did it. And he, he decided to, to leave, yeah. um, to his, his death as we find out. But, uh, but you're saying he basically, uh, could have felt like a, a sort of shame or sort of a, a, a knowing that it was a, a con or at the very worst or the very least something that was blown out of proportion. Perhaps he had a team up in that, that bell tower with him yeah. and, and they were killed or he killed them. Who knows? Yeah. With Tarantino. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting theory. I hadn't heard that before. Makes or sense. It could, it could be something in between too, that he was just a regular guy put in this situation. Like many soldiers get put into situations. They're not people who would ever in any other circumstance, kill people unless they were put into that situation. He could have been ashamed that he did kill somebody, yeah. people. Then he's not doubly ashamed that they take this incident that maybe he wasn't even nearly as brave as they want to make him out for propaganda purposes. So he's ashamed by that. 
And because I think you need an explanation going through of why at the end he tries to have his way with Shoshana Emanuel in the, um, what do they call it? The projector room. Yeah. Uh, well, something that, that shouldn't be forgotten was, uh, of course, this is un- uh, that, that movie would have been colored by the, the propagandistic paintbrush of, of Goebbels, the minister of propaganda. Um, so w- whatever that was, you can you can guarantee it's the one thing I am sure about is that the movie was a, a propagandistic parody of, of whatever actually happened. When he's in that project room, in my opinion, it's just a theory, uh, but in my opinion, that's the first and only time that we see the real Frederick Zoller come out. Yeah. He doesn't get what he wants, uh, and he he doesn't show too much shame in that moment, does he? You, you, you will recall, he says, you know, there are 300 men buried in wherever, uh, yeah. a testimony to the fact that, uh, you know, to, to not say no to me or, or something like that. Uh, I forget the exact phrasing. But uh, yeah, he basically tries to force himself on her, and um, uh, well, uh, spoiler alert: they they both get shot, they both die. And now a brief word from our sponsors. Yeah, that was one of the more. I think that was for me one of the more interesting scenes in the whole movie that we didn't really know him. And I almost, I think that was kind of the, some of the the weakness that I found in this movie is that maybe there was too much ambiguity in some of these characters that maybe Tarantino left too much. And then he just had to do the simplistic end that, oh, he throws himself. He really is truly the evil monster Nazi. And that wipes out all of that kind of layering that they put on him. Yeah, that's 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 possible. Uh, well, let, let me let me throw this at you. Um, is it possible that Frederick Zoller could have been just something like a like a MacGuffin as a it's character? True. Yeah, because because he doesn't really how did, uh, besides uh, killing Emmanuel Mimu, who anyone could have done. I mm-hmm. mean, that, that didn't have to be him. Um, and of course, his story is serving as an anchor point for the movie of which they all gather in the theater. What purpose to the plot did he really serve? He didn't, but as, as far as I can tell, I'm not sure he served any. Um, and and uh, I wonder if he was something like a throwaway character. We've talked in the past, I think it was the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood podcast. We talk about how uh, Tarantino builds his characters' exposition into their prose. Uh, and we saw this, I mentioned it earlier, with Brad Pitt as as Aldo Rain saying, you know, uh, uh, bootlegging in the main of the Altana Sea, mm-hmm. uh, right? And and you sort of get a, a sense of of where he he starts. Um, you get something a little similar to to Hans Landa when he says, "Well, the 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 um, Jew hunter thing is just a name that stuck, and that he was a womanizer, and and all this stuff." And of course, you see just a, a vast array of medals showing that he yeah. was certainly good at what he did. Um, but anyway, I, I don't see any of that with Frederick Zoller outside of that that uh uh the the outside of the bell tower incident what maybe tarantino put him in there for was that really uh, amazing movie inside of the movie which uh eli roth who played the bear jew he made that movie yeah and it was very well done too it had real dialogue it was done in native german um and you could see it um uh being a real movie and by the way on that point Tarantino also shows us uh, a real love for European and specifically German cinema. He talks about Lenny Riefenstahl, uh, m- maybe not her specifically for various reasons, but uh, but he talks about German cinema. And in fact, he casts uh, the great Michael Fassbender, who's another one of my favorite actors, um, as Lieutenant Archie Hickox of the British uh, Army. Uh, and he's conscripted into this effort uh, to help the bastards through no reason other than his expertise in German film, which is a little bit funny because you will recall in that scene with, with um, the general played by the way, by Michael, My- Mike Myers, if you blinked, you missed him. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, that the, the mission operation Kino, I think it was uh, demands a, an expert on German cinema. And it didn't, <laughs> um, there was no part of the, of the thing that really required any expertise. But uh, yeah, you see uh, in, as you see in most of Tarantino's film, a great love for 
specific niche cinema. We see it in Glorious Bastards with, with the Spaghetti Western. We see it in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood with the, with the Golden Age and Spaghetti Westerns, I have to say. Um, and of course, in the Grindhouse movies as well. I think that there's so many different moral choices that that choice that that farmer has to make, who could ever really say, anybody could say that, yeah, I, of course I would, you know, take whatever the punishment was to save another family. But then if your daughters are going to get killed in front of you, what decision do you make? I don't think anybody can really say what decision they would make until they were in that position. I really like the choice Tarantino made here because he could have just easily had La Petite stick to his guns. Londa brings his people in. They they find them, obviously, uh, and they kill them. You know, they kill everyone. Uh, you know, La Petite was another MacGuffin kind of character. He he didn't, you know, that's the one scene he's in. For all we know, Londa kills him anyway. Um, but he doesn't do that. Tarantino has La Petite make the decision to, to give them away, um, give it away. And I really like that choice because it felt very human. Um, a, 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 as you point out, yeah, in the idealized best versions of ourselves we'd all want to believe that you know not only would we oppose the nazis we would save and we would we would do our best oscar schindler you know deal and uh and 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 do that well but when push comes to actually shove and you have to think about your family and indeed your well-being i mean you know <laughs> you gotta you gotta come into the thing at some point what decision do we make and i really like the choice of La Petite giving them away. That that I, I I like that decision a lot. That goes straight through, I think, to the end where Aldo Reigns and the other the uh Inglorious Bastards, these Jewish people who I would bet that any one of them probably had family who were killed in the Holocaust. And you have to make this decision. Are you gonna let this completely evil SOB off of the uh, off the chopping block, Londa? even though the greater good will come out of it. It's kind of that La Petite choice, but flipped on its head. Sure it is. Well, well and that's a, a good segue to move into the um, the Bear Jew, uh, yeah. played played wonderfully by Eli Roth, who was, uh, got got jacked for that, for that yeah, role. Sure <laughs> shredded. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and uh, there was not a lot of exposition given to the Bear Jew. Um, you could easy enough to probably figure out he was Jewish. He was pissed off at what the Nazis were doing. And he was in a position to affect change uh, at the, at the end of a bat and did it. <laughs> um, yeah. And then the other uh, Jewish person uh, who spoke German, I think uh, whose name escapes me. He was one of the, one of them that was killed in the bunker along with um, Hugo Stiglitz. Yeah. He was good. Yeah. Good character. Uh, by the great Till Schweiger. Um, Schweiger. Uh, quite a lot of moral ambiguity there. Tell us a little bit about how Michael Fassbender's character approaches and becomes involved with the bastards, because that's an interesting, that it really all comes down to that one scene in the tavern, in the bunker or basement. Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting, uh, direction that the film takes. So you see, as you say, Michael Fassbender as Lieutenant Archie Hickox, the, the British armed forces, um, who's conscripted by, as I mentioned, the uh, General Ed Fennick, if I remember the name, by Mike Myers, um, with Winston Churchill in the room, uh, to go on this, this operation. Um, no real reason is given why. It's not, it's not known, uh, besides of what we know from history, obviously, but nothing's pointed, nothing's signaled in the movie as to um, how the, the, the British officers came to know the bastards and wanted to become involved in them. But the very next scene, we see Archie Hickox uh, um, with a a flat English accent um, entering the fray at the bunker with the bastards. Now that bunker scene. Oh, uh, and he speaks perfect, uh, perfect English, perfect German, uh, which is essential to this, this particular uh, plot point in the bunker. Now this scene was the longest in the entire movie. I think it, it came, it clocked in at something like 15 minutes, which is insane for a single scene. I mean, that, that, that's above, that's like twice as long <clears throat> as any other single scene. Um, so it's, it's him. And then it's uh, Till Schweiger as uh, Hugo Stiglitz. It's uh, Diane Kruger as uh, Bridget Van Hammersmark. And then a fourth guy uh, uh, who I simply cannot remember. I apologize. But their whole thing is there to, uh, to make 
a rendezvous with Bridget Van Hammersmark, who's a, a, a German film actor who's working for England as a double agent, which, I, by the way, I, I suspect might be a callback to Hedy Lamar, who was a. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, so the men to, to rendezvous with her and uh, they're interrupted by uh, they expect the basement's going to be empty, but it's not because uh, these troops were given the night off because one of them uh, had a baby that day um and uh and so they're they're parting it up in the in the bunker there are a few nazi officers that are there as well one of whom uh comes uh, comes to talk with the uh, with the bastards and hammersmark and uh hickox and um i think that scene is a master class an absolute master class in building suspense oh yeah it keeps bringing you up and then letting you down that with that um the nazi that we can't think of his name but he's i i mean it was just incredible he it, it just raises it to a fever pitch that you don't feel you can stand it and then he just brings it you everything back down yeah well and uh, no absolutely um acted phenomenally it's bugging me that i don't remember his name because he he did he was phenomenal but the uncomfortable laughing mm-hmm. uh and, and just everyone knows that everyone else is on edge yeah or, or 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 are they but that's the that's the suspense that's being that's being given to the audience um they play that card game um which i i don't know the name of it but they they meant to guess what character they write down on a card um that turning point was phenomenal for me i mean when uh it, 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 in the scene you know he they order three glasses for scotch and uh, michael fassbender gives himself away because he gives the three as you and I know it with the uh, the pointer, the middle and the ring finger, whereas the German way of giving the three is the the thumb, the pointer and the middle finger, which is uh, something that the Germans would and did notice as as Hammersmark put it in the very next scene. Um, and, you know, then he he, get, he gets called on it. The the German officer says, you're no more German than that scotch, which was, uh, I think, I think from the Scottish highlands and yeah that was a, a phenomenal phenomenal scene and then then you know there, there's 15 minutes of of build up and the suspense building and the actual scene of everyone getting killed is i don't think that scene's 5 seconds long they they also go from they're having a mexican standoff yes and then when the bastards come alda rains shouts down we're not going to have a mexican standoff yep yeah, and he, he even says, uh, you know, uh, not so fast, Willie. You know, uh, you, you know, you got machine guns. We come down there, we're dead. Up there, we've got grenades. They throw them down there, you're dead. <laughs> That's a Mexican standoff, and that was not the deal. And the Mexican standoff, by the way, is uh, another trope that Tarantino plays with fairly often in his movies. Um, the the one I'm, that's at the forefront of my mind is in Pulp Fiction. You know, towards the very end with uh, Vincent Vega, Jules, and uh, uh, Honey Bunny in the in that final scene in the diner um so uh uh yeah and then at the very end I, I, i'm not gonna lie i was a little, a little bit i felt bad for the i never thought i'd hear myself say this but i felt bad for the nazi because <laughs> you know he he honored the deal threw his gun to the side said take that that traitor point to bridget van Hammersmark, who's wounded and in the bunker with him and and get out of my sight and then she kills him I get it because they couldn't have anyone leave that bunker. Everyone, every single German in, down there had to die. Mm-hmm. But there is, as you say, the moral ambiguity and the um, s- perhaps um, the the confusion that the audience is then faced with of feeling bad for a Nazi because you know his son is born that day and he seems like a nice guy. <laughs> Tarantino breaks down that wall, I think, because you can. S- see that those guys at the other table, the German soldiers, they're just soldiers. They're fighting for an evil cause, but at the end of the day, they're just soldiers. Like it could have been our grandfathers at that table as American soldiers in World War II, you know what I mean? And that the fact that they were, uh, you know, that the, the, the main soldier, the sergeant or whatever, he was, he had just had his baby. And I, I think what uh, Tarantino did with that, and I, I said it before, but it just keeps sticking with me, is that they paint these guys as regular soldiers. Yeah, regular Joes. And when everybody gets killed, it's even more emotional. But it's it's giving you conflicted emotions, yeah, no, no, it is. And even to sharpen that point up a little bit, Steve, is uh, 
uh, you know, the, they, they make something in the scene about there being an officer's table and a and a enlisted men table. You know, that that that's part of the thing when uh, when Willie stumbles drunk to the officer's table, you know, uh, uh, you know, disassign officer's tish uh, and it's an officer's table. So they make that 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 separation. Yeah. The only people in the movie that really seem to believe in the German ideology or, or the you know, it might be more pointing to say the Nazi ideology, Nazism, Hitlerism. Uh, are the high-ranking officers so the people who maybe you maybe they've just picked up this episode and they listen to it and they haven't even watched the movie or maybe they've watched the movie and now they're listening to us how do you think from your perspective they should view this movie well for a start i'd uh i'd yell at them for not watching the movie first <laughs> <laughs> um uh, how they should view it. I think they should just uh, buckle up and have a blast. Like I said, it's the first time Tarantino really plays with the historical fiction narrative, which is a lot of fun, allows for a feral romp creatively um, in a way that you might not suspect. Like, I don't know about you, but like sort of towards the end, or once I realized it was historical uh, or, uh, you know, historical fiction at the very end, uh, spoiler alert, when uh, Hitler is shot by the bear Jew, um my, my my brain when i saw it for the first time in theaters went can he do that like my my, my brain honestly was, was like tarantino shouldn't is he allowed to do that <laughs> like well he just did um so yeah i would say you're gonna have a a really great time uh you're gonna see some phenomenal acting including christoph waltz uh in a performance that by the way landed him an oscar uh as as hans landa um and uh yeah, you get get ready for some violence. You'll love this one. As a little bit of a bonus for people who stuck in with us for four episodes on Quentin Tarantino's historical phase, and we're just going to wrap up and have some final thoughts on these four really incredible movies by Quentin Tarantino of The Hateful Eight, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Inglorious Bastards and Django Unchained in no particular order. There. <laughs> well, let's we'll put them in particular order. First was Inglorious Bastards in 2009, Django Unchained in 2000, 2012, 12, then uh, The Hateful Eight in 2014. Mm. Or was it 2018? I believe it was 2018, 2015. 2015. I was close. And then and then Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which was 2019. Yep. So um we saw I watch these movies in reverse and hmm. Josh watched them in the correct order. <laughs> I guess overall, Josh, and if anybody anybody wants to know more, go back and listen to the, the specific episodes. How do you see Tarantino progress through these movies? Do you see a progression necessarily through them? Uh, maybe a growth or a, an evolution, you might say? Um, You know, I didn't add... First, I, I do see as he moves through the historical fiction uh, genre, I do see a sort of refining. Um, so like in Inglorious Bastards, the the historical fiction aspect is is really character driven. Uh, you see it in, in well, you see it in, in all the characters. They're the, things that, they're the, the ones that drive everything forward. Um, and of course, that's true for the rest of the movies also. But like in his most recent Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you really see that historical fiction sort of branch out into the, the world and the universe. Yeah, I think for me, the, the evolution I saw was maybe a tightening of the stories. I see that he um, for me in Glorious Bastards was a lot going on. And it was maybe 10 different stories all running parallel to each other. And in a way, by the time you get to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it really is a one coherent narrative of these two guys going through, uh, you know, through this situation of living in Hollywood in the 60s. And I think that that was a difference in you see it that Django Unchained had a lot of things going on, a lot of moving parts, less so in The Hateful Eight. And then I think by the time we get to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it's pretty much that one narrative go weaving through it. And now a brief word from our sponsors. 
Yeah, and I was thinking as you were talking, well, which of these four movies would would be my favorite and, and why? Well, what's the one that has the most staying power with me? Well, Tarantino wins out here again because those all four of those movies have pretty phenomenal staying power, at least with me. And I'll I'll, I'll bet you I'm not alone. Um, but I do think Once Upon a Time in Hollywood might have to be my favorite because yeah, because because you're right, it's it's very tight. Everything in and around the movie centers around the characters in some way. It doesn't really veer off. Even with the Mansons, we, we only uh, the Manson family, we only see it uh, in the context of how Cliff uh, of how they interact with Cliff Booth and Rick Dalton. Yeah, right. Um, so, so yeah, uh, and even the Polanskis, we don't, uh, you know, we, we don't see a lot of them. I mean, Roman, uh, we talked in in that particular podcast. You know, we were, we had to think for a second if Roman Polanski even had a line. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Um, so yeah, I. I think everything was was tightened. I think the plot was more, let's say, robust because it was not being spread around a multiplicity of characters. It was focused specifically on Cliff Booth and, and Rick Dalton. Um, and and it also provides uh, fertile ground for Tarantino to expand on, uh, you know, as, as, as you know, because we've had the discussion off camera, Tarantino wrote a book. Uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which expands on that particular world, which is a phenomenal book, by the way. I, I've read it. Uh, oh, it's uh, great. Yeah, I, I only I, I got to admit, I've only read uh, the first couple chapters, but uh, looking forward to getting through all of it. I'd, I'd recommend it to anyone. I'm I'm hooked already. It's a slow burn novel like the movie is a slow burn, but it all keeps building on it. I agree with you that he very easily could have gotten lost in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood with all of the, by going too much with the with the Tates and Pol- Polanski, he could have gone too much with um, Pussycat and with, uh, with, with what was going on at the Spawn Ranch. It, it could have all, you know, he could have very easily have turned it into a, a, a remake of Helter Skelter, but he did, he really did everything fed into that, that essentially a buddy movie of Cliff and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, Caprio and uh, Pitt. Yeah, well, uh, you took words out of my mouth. I mean, like that scene in Spawn Ranch with Brad Pitt when he, when he, with Cliff Booth, rather, when he uh, drives Pussycat to the ranch. I mean, that scene, that scene could have been two hours long. Uh, I mean, that could have been, you know, uh, you could have had some exposition built out on on Pussycat because, you know, she looked like she could have served a, a, a significant role in the plot if 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 the plot went down that avenue. You know, um, it's not George isn't really explained. The character uh, Bruce Stern's character isn't isn't really fully explained. You feel like there's more more to, to nab at there, but I think Tarantino um, keeps it disciplined, keeps it focused. And, and, and yeah, that, that would probably be why it would be my favorite one. We, uh, Django Unchained, by the way, not to take anything from uh, Tarantino won uh, uh, Christoph Waltz, by the way, won his second Oscar <laughs> as uh, Dr. Kane Schultz in, in Django Unchained phenomenally well done. And I think it still is, is fairly tight, um, but there is, it, it does go off in a lot of bit in a lot of uh, directions. Uh, in terms of genre, it's a romantic. It's a romantic film. It's a buddy film, as you point out. It's a uh, it's an action film. It's a revenge fantasy, and of course, there's a historical aspect that's that's woven into it. So I think I think he Tarantino tightens everything, keeps everything more and more focused as he goes along in the movies. One point that I we were kind of at disagreement with is Hateful Eight. Yours was saying that that was probably your least favorite, not to put words in your mouth. Whereas I think it was, I, would, I wouldn't put Hateful Eight above Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but it was a really good movie for me. I loved that it it melded in the genres of the Western, which I love, and the, uh, the, the Hitchcock-esque aspect of it of a uh one room play really i really did enjoy that um yeah and i i certainly didn't hate it uh out of the four movies we're discussing uh it would have to be my least favorite actually partially for the reasons that for the reason that you mentioned at the end there um in that podcast i i think i referenced a a terrible movie called the boss's daughter by ash uh, that ashton kutcher was in that takes place effectively in one setting that forever turned me off to movies that that take place in one singular environment but tarantino you know and, and that that was 
uh, part of my biases, you know, with hatefully. And then also, I mean, in discussion about talking about character development and a lack of exposition, enough is given to the characters that we find out at the end are members of the Domingue gang. We we have their intention. We know why they're there. And when we know we know roughly what they do, they're OK, they're gangsters. They they loot. They they murder. They you know, who knows what else we we, we get that. But there's not a lot of backstory uh, beyond that. Now, I get it. I mean, there's eight freaking characters. I mean, <laughs> unless you want the movie to be, you know, 15 hours long, you can only do so much. Right. So, um, yeah, it was a it was a good movie. Um, I personally I really like Tim Roth. Yeah, I he think, was great in it. Yeah, he was. I, I think Tim Roth is one of the most underrated actors ever. He was in a wonderful movie that no one's heard of called Funny Games, uh, which is a remake of a of a movie. But anyway, a really good horror movie with him and Nicole Kidman that I, I would recommend. Um, and I feel like he was underutilized in that movie um, as uh, Oswaldo Mowbray, or, or who we think is Oswaldo Mowbray. Uh, I, I would have liked to have seen a bit more of him. Um, and uh, let's see. I think that might be it as far as hatefully. I want to be really clear. I I liked the movie. Oh, oh, that was the other thing I wanted to say. Um, yeah, one thing I loved about it was uh, when you mentioned Hitchcock. I, I assume you were referring to the mystery aspect of the movie. Um, and that was wonderful. I mean, finding out who poisoned the coffee. That was. It, it made me want to see a bit more uh, uh, mystery play by by Tarantino. I have to say. Um, Hopefully, I, I'm I'm really hoping he doesn't stick to his ten picture uh, thing. Um, that would that would suck. But if if he doesn't stick to it, um, I hope he we see a mystery from him in the future. By the way, for our, our listeners, he made a, a a proclamation or or an announcement uh, a while back that he was going to quit uh, quit directing after ten films. So I I'm not sh- he's got to be uh, probably one left. I don't know. Yeah, I guess it depends on how you count some of them, because he did some as a producer and a writer. Right. Like he did from Dust Till Dawn. He actually wrote uh, the treatment for Natural Born Killers, which a lot of people don't know about. He had no no part in anything else than that. Uh, Sin City, he was a guest director on. So I don't know if that would count, you know, um, uh, True Romance, you know, who. But anyway, we'll we'll see. Now, I think this one might be one that we're in complete agreement on is the best scene of any of these four movies and that's without for my, for my money was leonardo dicaprio and django unchained in the dinner scene dude that that scene is horrifying i mean to think that this is the same guy that played jack dawson on titanic is phenomenal to think about i mean this is come on this is arnie from gilbert grape for pete's sake you know um and uh uh yeah that was some of the most phenomenal acting i've ever seen ever uh when, when he gets really low and you feel you feel the entire energy in the room shift you know this is a skull of old ben and you see the anger yeah just permeating out of him and you know poor carrie washington took it like a champ too you know he's he's grabbing her neck he's smearing yes we know it's fake blood but still smearing you know blood on her face um yeah th- there was a i watched that scene fairly often actually on youtube just because the acting is so incredible um and uh, one of my one of my favorite comments is that uh, he, as you know, he smokes a cigarette during the scene or, or part of the scene. And uh, one of the comments is that Tarantino's acting is so good, I can smell the cigarette smoke. <laughs> I th- it's so that scene, the the turn that DiCaprio's character makes that he's just everything says up to that point. He's just a playboy. Everybody else runs the plantation. He's just. Um, a a, a wastrel he drinks he's a partier like he has no substance and then that scene where he just it's like a light gets switched on and he's just a completely different person yeah well yeah well and and that's another um morality thing also you see the true uh almost said hens lenda you you see the true calvin candy come out um uh someone who you know acts with no conscience i mean that scene even um the scene with um, uh, D'Artagnan, the 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 slave that he sticks the dogs on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, even just that 
that coldness was was incredible. I mean, phenomenal, phenomenal acting. To to think that he didn't want to do it at first because he he had it, DiCaprio. I mean, didn't want to do the role um, because you know he didn't want to scream out the n word and he had big reservations. The fact that he didn't want to do that and turned out a performance like that. If it was anyone other than Christoph Waltz getting the Oscar, um, I would have. That, you know what? No, I'm going to say it anyway. That really is one of those things. Like, how did he not get nominated? Yeah. I mean, it was. And also, sorry, last thing. Uh, not for nothing. It's the first movie in how long that he doesn't have a lead role. That should say something about how much people want to work with Tarantino. <laughs> you know, I think the last little factoid at that they were actually uh, considering putting DiCaprio as Londa in inglorious bastards i think that would have been not the best choice i think christoph waltz nailed it so incredibly i don't think that dicaprio would have quite done it like that yeah you know i i had heard that myself i, I remember reading that and and thinking uh, you know I'm, I'm a big leo fan uh, i would have loved to have seen him give it a shot as as Hans Landa, and I'm sure he would have done a great job. I'm sure he would have put his own spin on it, and I'm sure it would have been completely different from, you know, from from Christoph Waltz. But it is kind of one of those things. Like once you see Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark, you just no one else does it. It's it's just not it's not in the cards. You know, uh, Robert uh, Robert Downey Jr. has to be Tony Stark. That's that's all there is to it. Um, just like Sly Stallone has to be Rocky or Rambo. I want to thank you so much, Josh, for going through these four films with me. I, I expect we will be talking again soon, maybe about mm-hmm. not about Tarantino, but some maybe some other things. But uh, I have had um, a great amount of time going through these four movies with you. Well, thank you, man. No, the, the, the pleasure is all mine, Steve. Uh, once you when you gave me the invitation, I, I, I leapt for joy. So when it's Tarantino, I always have time. So it's it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And, and uh, yeah, for for listeners interested, uh, there's a forthcoming podcast on the Parthenon Network that I'll be coming out with called Eyewitness History, where I curate uh, stories from people that were eyewitnesses to historical events such as 9-11. Um, I have two interviews with the Holocaust survivor, in fact, uh, that will be coming out as well. And then I also have my own personal podcast called the unfiltered podcast with Josh Cohen, where I interview various thought leaders from all kinds of fields, uh, whether it's professional singers, whether it's uh, scientists, whether it's authors and journalists. Um, So uh, anyone that wants to check that out unfiltered with Josh Cohen and keep an eye out for eyewitness history with Josh Cohen on the Parthenon podcast network. Yeah. Look for those soon. uh, Go over to Parthenon podcast.com to learn more and um yeah i think you will not be you will not be wasting your time to list checking out those podcasts that's for sure 